From the KPFK studios in Southern California, it's the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Stand up, stand up, you've been sitting way too long. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. My name is Steve Scrovan. Today I'm coming to you from Princeton, New Jersey. David is coming to you from Los Angeles, California. We like to switch coasts every once in a while. And Ralph is from Connecticut. And David, our guest today comes to us from Ithaca, New York, where we have one of our first loyal affiliates, WRFI 88.1 from Ithaca and Watkins Glen. That's right. If you're listening to us in Ithaca, you all know Walter Hang. He's the president of Toxics Targeting, an environmental database firm in Ithaca that has compiled detailed information on more than 700,000 known and potential toxic sites throughout New York State. Toxics targeting sophisticated maps and database reports are used by engineers, environmental consultants, drinking water suppliers, and home buyers to investigate toxic hazard concerns. Since 2009, Toxics Targeting has conducted an extensive public education and grassroots activism campaign to safeguard New York from Marcellus shale fracking pollution threats. Ralph, welcome Walter Hang. Walter, it's good to have you on. I've known Walter for many years. He was on the Phil Donahue show when he worked as a scientist for the New York Public Research Group, NYPIRG, on this waste ship that had all the waste products. Nobody wanted to take it. It went up and down the East Coast and in the Gulf. And Walter and Phil were on that ship in a memorable show. Walter, we're going to talk about a rare citizen victory in in a year that hasn't had many citizen victories and had a pretty bad election on November 4th. And that is the announcement by Governor Cuomo for science reasons at a press conference he held with the science advisors that fracking was not going to be allowed in New York State compared to Pennsylvania, where it has been quite devastating to the environment. Walter, why don't you talk about what made Andrew Cuomo, a very cautious politician who fiddled and faddled for a lot of months on this fracking decision, turn out the right way, although you have a particular strategy that you want to talk about as an alternative to the ban on fracking. Why don't you start right from the beginning when you first heard about this fracking in your state? Well, I live in Ithaca, New York, which is directly on top of this giant so-called tight shale formation. It starts southwest of Syracuse in Marcellus, New York. That's where it hits the surface of the land. And believe it or not, it goes all the way to Tennessee. And so this rock formation has natural gas in it. But unlike the big pressurized pockets that many traditional conventional gas wells tap into, this rock has tiny pores of methane gas. And the only way to get the gas out is you have to drill down to the formation, which is on average one mile deep. Then you have to drill horizontally through the formation. And then believe it or not, you have to eventually pump under enormous pressure, this fracking fluid, which has chemical additives to reduce the friction of this fluid, and there's sand in there. And so this pressurized fluid cracks the rock for hundreds and hundreds of feet. Then the sand gets shot into those tiny little cracks, and then that holds the cracks open, and the gas can then be extracted. And believe it or not, this is done up to 16 wells every square mile because it's so costly to get the five to seven million gallons of fracking fluid each well pad. So every 640 acres, every square mile, there's a well pad with up to 16 wells and it's just a vast industrialization and it has really been unprecedented. So in 2008, they proposed that in New York And thank goodness, the Patterson administration, David Patterson was our governor at the time, along with the Department of Environmental Conservation Commissioner, Pete Granis, and various advisors, they decided we're not going to allow shale fracking to begin in New York until we adopt comprehensive public health and environmental safeguards. 
Now, they thought that that would be over pretty quickly when they proposed the draft supplemental generic environmental impact statement. It's an incredibly complicated permit guideline proceeding. And so I was living in Ithaca. I didn't know anything about shale fracking, but I was very dubious that it could be done safely on such a huge scale. So I started going to meetings and I would meet all these wonderful, you know, heartfelt activists who really didn't know anything. And so I finally realized that this was very likely going to happen unless I personally intervened and challenged the assertion by the state of New York that this shell fracking could be done properly, that the regulation of all the existing gas and oil extraction activities going back almost two centuries had never caused problems. So as you know, Ralph, the rule is trust but verify. And so I started to look at the data for literally tens of thousands of spills associated with potential gas and oil extraction activities. And I was not that shocked to find out that in reality, there had been hundreds of fires, explosions, polluted water supply wells, massive uh, gas and oil wastewater spills up to... Over what period of time, Walter? Literally decades, but also very current. And so this destroyed the myth that New York State had properly regulated these activities. I document this. I wrote a very nice letter to Governor Patterson. He never responded. I then got enormous press coverage about this primarily through Tom Wilbur of the Press and Sun Bulletin in Binghamton. And then I converted my letter to a coalition letter. I had never done this before. And in six weeks, I got 6,000 signatories. But more importantly, I got enormous press coverage. And that is when we really slowed down the approval of the so-called draft supplemental generic environmental impact statement. And, And so that's how we survived that initial period of time when it looked like shell fracking was literally going to be approved in a matter of just a couple of months. Just as it has been all over the country. That's right. It's now spread from coast to coast to more than half the states in the nation. And it's not only for natural gas, it's also for oil. And that's how come there's so much gas and oil on the market now that we're looking at a huge glut. And that's how come gasoline prices per gallon are in some places in the country less than $2. So this is all because of this massive shale fracking that's going on in places like the Bakken Formation, the Eagle Ford Formation, and the Marcellus Formation. And Ralph, you mentioned Pennsylvania. So when you look at Pennsylvania, look at New York, Pennsylvania threw caution to the wind. They had a real mining culture, and they basically said, bring it on, we're ready. Let's start the shell fracking right off the bat. And then they allowed more than 7,000 wells to be fracked. But what people didn't know until Ian Urbina reported in the New York Times that the disposal of the gas fracking wastewater actually polluted the drinking water for 850,000 people living near Pittsburgh in 2008 who drank public water from the Monongahela River. So the whole river got so polluted with what are called total dissolved solids that the water couldn't be consumed. In comparison, you look at New York and the authorities basically said, again, we're not going forward until we adopt the comprehensive safeguards And that proceeding hasn't been completed to this very day because of all the documented problems, because we understood how government works, because we involve literally tens of thousands of citizens, activists of every stripe, academicians, researchers, physicians, and that's how we got these issues addressed. Talk about the demonstrations and the marches in Albany and elsewhere and the role of some of the major environmental organizations, which you have been critical of. The major environmental organizations did very little. They basically you know, supported uh, shale fracking. They didn't really fight in any meaningful way to make sure that the massive shortcomings in the original draft that's guys would be addressed. And so we basically worked around them. I mean, our campaign is so incredibly grassroots, it really can't even be believed. It's literally ordinary people, it's it's religious leaders, it's students, it's business owners, it's farmers, all who pretty much 
came out of the woodwork, showed up at events, and they basically began to understand what shale fracking was. They understood the shortcomings of the proposed safeguards. And then they just, as a matter of course, said, I'm not letting this happen. I'm going to fight back. And so initially, we had maybe 100 people at the first big demo uh, in Albany in early 2011. By last year at State of the State, we had more than 2,000 screaming fractivists, waving signs, trooping up and down the concourse. We've been so strong and so effective at organizing these events that Governor Cuomo has been totally afraid to even show his face. When Barack Obama came to Binghamton, New York, the epicenter of the proposed Marcella Shale fracking region, a year ago, August, Governor Cuomo wouldn't even show up because he knew that there were going to be, you know, hundreds, ultimately more than a thousand fractivists screaming their heads off. So this has truly been a mass movement. But the key thing, it wasn't led by the corporate environmentalists. It was led by individuals. It was led literally from the grassroots up. Listen, Walter, how did you deal with relatively poor landowners in southern New York State, around Binghamton and to the west, who were looking at their neighbors in Pennsylvania, similarly modest landowners, who were making considerable money from the royalties, although there were subsequent reports that the gas and oil companies were defrauding them on the royalty amount. But anyway, they were making money. How did you change their minds, or did they resist you? Well, it was very interesting. You know, I always said I'm not against natural gas per se. I heat my house with natural gas. I cook with natural gas. You know, I drive a car. I'm not someone that says we should all hunt and gather again. Uh, but what I said was I'm totally against toxic pollution. I know a lot about the way government functions. I know a lot about pollution hazards. And so we were able to basically make very, very strong, effective arguments that many of these people had lived on farms that had been in their families for multiple generations. And they all said the same thing. I would never allow shale fracking if I thought that it would harm you know, the land that my family has tilled and which I want to leave to my children. And the water is always the most important issue. People always say, I don't want to drink water that's toxic contaminated. And so slowly but surely from the first round of investigatory findings, we were able to cast doubt on the Department of Environmental Conservation's narrative that they were fully effective, that they were able to protect public health and the environment, that they were able to protect drinking water. I would literally go out into the field and I would find people like Dave Eddy, this guy that basically lived in an area where there had been many, many traditional conventional wells drilled in Andover, New York. And so there was fracking across the street from his home and it kept impacting his well. He literally had to run for his life when his house filled up with natural gas. His very infant children were literally taking a bath the first time that the toxic pollution came blasting out of the tap in the bathtub. And I had documentation from U.S. Energy admitting that they polluted his water with petroleum and they actually paid for a filter at least for a while. So Slowly but surely, by making these documented incidents widely available through the press, on the Internet, we completely undermined this vision that shale fracking was safe, that everyone was going to make a ton of money. And it began to raise doubt. It began to raise questions. And then by working with elected officials, by working with academic researchers, by building a very, very strong, effective coalition, Ultimately, we basically turned the tide, and when the governor announced that there would be a prohibition against shale fracking on December 17th, we had essentially reversed the DEC's original position that this could be done safely, and they were on the verge of allowing it. And so now we don't know if there will be a permanent legal bar, otherwise known as a ban, but what we do know is that New York State is saying we're not going to allow this. 
and we're waiting for the final S guys after nearly seven years to finally come out to see whether or not they've addressed all of our concerns. And then there's going to be a legal finding statement issued, and we'll find out what are the circumstances of the prohibition. How long might it last? Might it be revisited? But this is a landmark achievement, and it is essentially, I believe, an example that can be replicated all across the country, wherever shale fracking is either already underway or it's been proposed. And uh, New York State is now the first state in the country uh, to ban uh, fracking, correct? Well, it's the first state that's going to prohibit shale fracking where there is actually shale. So Vermont banned it, but they don't have any shale. That was a purely symbolic victory. So this is really a toe-to-toe, head-to-head, knockdown, drag-out fight that fractivists won at the grassroots level with virtually no support from the big green groups who literally took tens of millions of dollars of contributions from the firms that wanted to do the fracking, as Russell Mokhyber famously reported with Chesapeake and the Sierra Club. So I really believe that this is a revitalization. It's a rebirth of the American environmental movement. And I believe we have just begun to fight. I have a question. You're referring to Russell Mokhyber as the editor of the Corporate Crime Reporter in Washington, D.C. The question is, what were the giant energy companies doing while you were, shall we say, fracking them (laughs) with your exposés, showing that the chemicals they use in fracking were not benign, that drinking water and groundwater was being contaminated, noise, all kinds of dust levels, highways, roads being ripped up with these big trucks. What were the opponents doing in Albany trying to persuade Governor Cuomo the other way? And and name some names of these companies and their techniques fighting you. Well, the most important thing that they did was they originally tried to assert that this was going to be good for the economy, that this was going to generate, you know, a huge number of jobs. And they asserted that it could be done safely. So once we began to challenge that, once we started to hammer away on all the problems that we documented with New York State's own data, they failed to really anticipate how much of a problem this was going to be to their credibility. And they tried to fight back tooth and nail. They spent an incredible amount of money on ads that, you know, this is a a new beginning for American becoming independent from foreign oil and gas sources and things like that. But they never really were able to get a grip on what was happening. And I don't think they also anticipated how big the opposition was ultimately going to grow. And they never did what we did, which was to work 24 hours a day, practically, seven days a week for more than five years to keep our finger on the pulse of exactly what was going on and to regularly hammer away on the shortcomings of New York State's protection programs. And so by the time they figured out that they had to get out of Albany, out of the Capitol, and begin to work at the grassroots level, it was really too late. We had won a series of very important victories. For example, Chesapeake, which is one of the biggest frackers in the country, wanted to pump gas drilling wastewater into a disposal well in Pulteney, New York. And this is right next to Cuca Lake. I mean, an amazingly beautiful historic lake. And so two citizens contacted me, the Androsics, and we had an event on a Friday, and then we got 500 people on Super Bowl Sunday. So this was, I believe, 2010. And we ultimately defeated that project and Chesapeake withdrew their application for this deep well injection disposal site. And that had an amazing effect. And in classic fashion, we met a professor, Richard Young at Geneseo College, and he knew so much about the geology of the Marcellus Shale Formation. He was Cornell trained. I mean, he was just an amazing resource. And so we began to find these people and we went after every single industry that we could find. 
Another big one was Fortuna, now known as Talisman. I had met many of these people when they came to work on the Trenton Black River Formation. They started showing up in Ithaca because they were all from Western Canada. Uh, And kids would say, yeah, you know, I haven't skated for five years, but I want to get back playing hockey. My family's been living in Jakarta, Indonesia. And I'd say, what were you doing there? And they said, oh, my dad works for some kind of gas company. And so slowly, these kids just started showing up all over the place. And again, that added to our sense that something big was happening. And that's how we slowly but surely understood the scope of this uh, challenge. And we just found more and more people to fight these local issues. We blocked public land leasing in Broome County, not once, but twice. And so slowly but surely, we beat these companies head to head, toe to toe, with basic research, with policy advocacy, with media outreach, you know, with all of the things, Ralph, that you have taught us how to do. Those coalitions became stronger and stronger with each victory. You know, we shared all of this information. I wrote literally hundreds of alerts. And so it wasn't just, you know, we want a ban, we don't want this, we don't like this, we want clean water. I very slowly, over the course of five years, found more and more people who, in effect, could really understand the proceeding and could understand how to use the secret handshake, you know, with elected officials. And that's, I believe, ultimately how we basically became an insurmountable barrier to shell fracking in New York. Well, yeah, this leads, uh, the listeners should be uh, very focused on the strategy here. You notice that Walter was not talking about playing defense. He played offense. He was, his group and all the people from scientists to people who helped in every area around the state of New York, they were always ahead of Chesapeake Oil and Gas and the other companies. They were never behind. They were always ahead. And these companies Companies with their lobbies, they couldn't catch up. They couldn't react in time. They made blunders. They missed the signs of resistance. They underestimated them. So just to flesh this out a little bit, did you use the courts? Did you use any of the regulatory agencies? Did you have help in the legislature? And did you find that the energy companies were pouring money into the coffers of the lawmakers and Governor Cuomo's campaign? Can you run through that sequence to broaden out the overall context of what you all did? Well, the key thing was that my original strategy was completely obvious to me. And I've been doing this work now, unbelievably, for almost 40 years. So we had a de facto moratorium against shale fracking until this final supplemental generic environmental impact proceeding could be completed. So I just said, we're going to prevent the final guys from being adopted until all of our documented concerns have been fully addressed. And I believe that if we could achieve that, the moratorium would just keep going and going and going. And again, so far, it's gone almost seven years. So I never really deviated from that fundamental strategy. And then ultimately, the governor tried to buy off the big green groups by undertaking what they call the Department of Health review of the health impact analysis in the draft desk guys, because there were so many public health concerns that had been raised. But we had been beating on the big green groups so brutally by that point that they couldn't take the crumb. So then we erected a second line of defense. No final guys could be adopted until this Department of Health review was finished, and that was being done completely in secret. The scope of the proceeding was not even written down on a single piece of paper, and originally they were only going to put 25 hours worth of work into this proceeding. And so we battered that secret, no public participation proceeding for more than two years, and that's ultimately what came out on December 17th that said, You know, there's so many uncertainties, given the scientific data that are available, that New York is going to prohibit shell fracking because of the likelihood of environmental and public health hazards. So, as you know, they say in the business that if your only tool is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. So it was almost impossible to hold together 
the groups that were originally involved in this campaign. So you had groups that immediately ran off to chase dead bills in the legislature. And so, as you know, there's an enormous amount of posturing And the simplest thing in the world to do is for a legislator to sponsor a bill and then not do the heavy lifting to make the deal to make sure that those uh, bills get enacted into law. But because I knew the secret handshake, we worked very well with legislators, just not on legislation. We focused entirely on this Eskais proceeding and ultimately on the Department of Health review. But many of the big green groups wasted years on dead bills. What do you mean by secret handshake? And did you have legislative hearings that satisfied you in Albany? Well, as you know, you can work with legislators and you can work with the people who want to work with you. And you can understand that basically leadership decides everything. And so from the top, you know, where the Speaker of the Assembly is, from the head of the State Senate, you know, sit, then all the way down to the members, rank and file members, There's a whole hierarchy. And so we work very well with the key committee chairs, uh, the health committee, the environmental conservation committee. We worked with, you know, individual members from the Marcellus Shale Formation, notably Barbara Lifton, an amazingly terrific, powerful, dedicated assembly representative, Donna Lopardo, who is the assembly representative from the Binghamton area, who was a member of the Hydraulic Advisory Committee. And then we also had an amazing secret weapon, Matt Ryan, who was the former Binghamton mayor. I mean, these people cast aside all political considerations. They said, you know, I'm going to protect my constituents. I don't care what it takes. I don't care what I have to do. I'm not laying down on this issue. And so we knew how to reward them for their hard work. We knew how to make their constituents understand that they were all in on these fights. And so that's very unusual, as you know. And so ultimately, we had so many members in the Assembly and also in the State Senate who would sign these excruciatingly detailed coalition letters that were very specific. Again, the opposite of I want clean water, you know, which they call toilet paper in the business because anyone will sign that stuff. Our letters really, really were detailed. They were well documented. And whenever we put them out, we got more press coverage. And ultimately, we had an amazing amount of support, particularly in the assembly. And that was crucial because essentially in 2012, there was a looming crisis at hand. The year before, the Cuomo administration had tried to adopt regulations that would codify the final S guys. And then as you know, they the tried final to what? What? The this final supplemental what? generic environmental impact statement that had to be adopted before shale fracking would be permitted. Then they tried to buy off the big green groups with this Department of Health review. So all three things had to be done by November 28th. Otherwise the proceeding would expire unless there was a one-time three-month extension on the rulemaking proceeding. And so that's what the governor did. He went all in. He introduced this revised rulemaking proceeding, but it couldn't be completed until both the final supplemental generic environmental impact statement and the Department of Health review were completed. And we killed that entire proceeding very likely because the assembly speaker told the governor one-on-one in a room that if he required this proceeding to be completed during budget session, he was not going to get an on-time budget. There would be blood on the floor. And that's how on February 12th, 2013, the health commissioner, Nirav Arshaw, wrote this famous letter, I'm not done the revised rulemaking proceeding collapsed in a shockingly embarrassing failure for the Cuomo administration. And then not that long afterwards, Nirav Shaw basically got pounded so brutally, he ultimately quit and went to California. And again, that further delayed all of these proceedings until December 17th, when finally the Cuomo administration said, we're not allowing shale fracking. So there's so many little efforts involving key players. 
you know the name of the game. You have to persuade these people that it's in their political interest as well as in the public interest to go out and slay the dragon. That's not easy. You have to be able to deliver incredible public support. And if they're going against you, you have to really make them pay the price for not doing the right thing. And that's what we were able to do. And you kept conveying to him that this thing was not going away. It was going to get bigger and bigger, more people, more demos, more disclosures. That's the point, you see. They didn't think they could wear you out by delaying. They didn't think they could wear this movement against fracking down by attrition. Now, is it fair to say that you, you all got this done without much use of the courts, which most environmental battles end up in? Well, no final S guys was ever adopted, you know, prior to this recent prohibition announcement. So there was no Article 78 proceeding to challenge the properly conducted effort. However, there was a sidebar litigation that everyone praised in the beginning, and that was about home rule. So certain communities wanted to be able to ban shale fracking in their jurisdiction. And this was litigated and it was decided that it could be banned. Every municipality, every municipality could decide for itself, you mean? Correct. But as you know, that doesn't really reflect the political reality that many, many areas wanted shale fracking sooner rather than later, as quickly as possible, because they all thought they were going to become rich. And so if you look at a map of where the shell fracking bans and moratoria were, they were never, hardly ever, in the areas where the shale fracking was most likely to occur. And those were Broome County, Tioga County, Chemung County, Steuben County, and in Shenango County. And that's that southern tier area along the border with Pennsylvania where shale fracking was already underway. So in that whole area, there were only two tiny moratoria, one in the city of Binghamton, one in Owego, New York, but we already had a moratorium statewide, so those were symbolic. And then there was one ban in the teeny little village of Oxford. So I actually was not that enamored of home rule because I believed that this would be a way to make a deal where the governor could say, hey, let's just allow it where people want it. They can decide for themselves. And as you know, the money is so immense with extraction mining that once it begins, once people start getting the campaign contributions, it very, very quickly becomes a matter of the haves and the have-nots. So I didn't like that, I didn't work on it, but it did make a lot of awareness, but ultimately we were successful in protecting all New Yorkers from shale fracking. And in fact, Danny Hakem of the New York Times reported in 2012 that the governor was going to, again, allow it on a limited basis, only where people wanted it in these economically depressed areas along the border with Pennsylvania and Southern Tier. And we immediately launched a campaign that said equal protection for all New Yorkers from shale fracking. And we asserted that it shouldn't be allowed anywhere in New York until it was deemed safe everywhere in New York. We battered those big green groups uh, to get them to sign a pledge. And only Donna Lopardo, the assembly rep, uh, took that strong position. They were always shilling for the governor. They were always trying to provide political cover for the governor. Uh, but fortunately, ultimately, we all survived. It has been prohibited statewide. And since we don't know why the governor did what he did, anyone and everyone that helped now gets a share of the credit. Walter, before we close, let's go nationwide here. What are going to be the repercussions on states like Pennsylvania? In Oklahoma, they've noticed earthquakes as a result of fracking more than once. Are you getting calls to go to other states and rally from the thrust of your victory here? Uh, Or is this going to be localized pretty much in New York? Is it going to have a beneficial effect to reverse the tide of fracking, which is devastating the most important natural resource of all, which is, of course, water? Well, as I indicated, shale fracking has begun in more than half the states in the nation. And there are opposition efforts 
in all of those areas. And we'll find out whether or not, you know, they are able to mount the types of very highly coordinated campaigns that I believe are required to beat the fossil fuel industry. The problem is that there are so many groups out there who don't know what it takes to win these big battles. Uh, And they think that having a message like we want to ban is enough and it's not. Or they don't really know how to work with their elected officials at the local, state and federal level in order to be able to hold them accountable. So we have an amazing precedent. We have an effective model that could be replicated. And we'll find out whether or not groups are willing to learn how to do this hard work. But again, it's not like running a few radio ads. It's not like, you know, having a coalition where people say, you know, we want a ban. you got to really work from top to bottom, day and night, because otherwise you're going to get outspent. It's going to be very, very hard to document these problems effectively. You once told me, you won't remember, many, many years ago that, you know, if you believe in the cause, you have to be willing to hit the road. You have to go out and you have to meet these people face to face, one on one. And an organizer basically lies down next to these people and gives them an infusion of energy and of commitment and of know-how. And then you basically see if you can begin to win victories. And if you win enough victories, the whole thing just begins to expand in intensity. And the next thing you know, you have so many lines of attack that even the biggest corporations on the planet can't fight them all. You have people on hunger strikes. You have people phone banking. You have people opposing infrastructure. You have people trying to pass home rule. You have lunatics like me trying to document these incredibly detailed problems using the government's own data or making internet map server uh, applications so people can see where all the uh, abandoned and unplugged wells are. By the way, your your listeners can go to ToxicsTargeting.com and click on Marcella Shale. They can see every article we generated. They can see the map server. They can see all of our letters, all totally respectful, very, very reasonable. And it'll be a question, can we do this in enough places so that ultimately, as they say, we sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and actually make meaningful progress in getting rid of the horrible fossil fuel addiction that has our entire nation, our entire planet in its grips. Because if we can't end fossil fuel extraction of oil and of natural gas, the cost is going to require such huge investments It'll take another 50 years to amortize all these debts. So this is a very, very important moment. And Ralph, you know better than anyone what it takes to win against these giant corporations, to bend the Congress, to bend the state legislatures to your will. And basically, we need every person, every environmental group, every civic organization from coast to coast to join the effort. And if we are able to do that, you know, then we're going to be effective, just as we were with toxic dumps, nuclear power, and so many other fights uh, that you spearheaded so many years ago. We're replicating your model of research, advocacy, grassroots organizing. Well, I think think what you're saying, Walter, to to our listeners is that you did state-of-the-art. You took it to with other people. You took the knowledge, the disclosures, the exposés, you hammered it, You developed intensity and emotional intelligence among all thousands of people from all backgrounds. You had to focus on the the governor, on the legislature. You weren't diverted, and you were always on the offensive. See, that's the key. You didn't just play defense. You played offense where you forced these companies to try to react, and they can never catch up with you. So that's why it's important all over the country where the fights against fracking are at a more amateur level, a more hesitant level, a more plea level to learn from what you all did. So you want to give slowly that website again so people can connect, see how you did it, and take some of those lessons to Texas, Oklahoma, Missouri, Pennsylvania, and other states. 
So people can go to ToxicsTargeting, one word, dot com. You can Google us. And you can then click on the Marcella Shale special section, lower right-hand corner. And I believe that there will be literally thousands of people out there who will be coachable, that they will say, wow, I really want to stop shale fracking in my state, but I need help. I need to know how to do the research, how to figure out the best policies, the best strategy, the best tactics, how to get press coverage, how to reward friends and punish enemies in this fight. And I believe that those people can learn from what we've done in New York. And if enough of them do it, I think we can prevail. But it really requires an amazing effort. When you think that the big corporate environmental groups are literally spending hundreds of millions of dollars you know, that they raise from foundations and from individuals and from, you know, big polluters, that's a lot of money that could go into grassroots efforts. So either we have to get those groups to get, you know, more spine and to start fighting as if it means something, you know, or we have to develop an alternative way to hold government to hold corporate polluters accountable. That's the name of the game. You always ask very nicely, if they give you a favorable reply, you thank them. That's why we're thanking Andrew Cuomo so much. When Kevin McCabe, his Southern Tier coordinator, called me to give me a heads up about what was going to be happening, I said, you get me in the room, I will praise him to high heaven. And I meant it. But if people don't give you a favorable reply, if they don't want to do what's needed to protect the environment, the natural resources, public health, then they have to pay a price at the polls. They have to basically take the heat. And then you try to you know, chart the course that begins to win enough victories to ultimately change the course of the environmental movement, change the course of the advocacy efforts that you really initiated so many decades ago. It can well, Walter, be done. It's just a lot of work. Walter has been critical of these mainstream environmental groups. They've gotten a little too comfortable. They're relying more and more on corporate contributions, corporate people on their boards of directors. And as a result, when they confronted this fracking hazard, they're willing to settle for too little. And that could undermine the efforts, except that a whole new wave of intensity at the grassroots all kinds of new people, people you know at Cornell, Walter, yourself, others, pumping in the knowledge and learning how to get the press to treat this resistance against fracking as a daily beat, not just, you know, a Sunday feature, that all came together, laser beam, on Governor Cuomo and the state legislators. So that's why it was a real pleasure having you on, because this is a new chapter in the intensity of the grassroots environmental movement. And I would say to the large environmental groups like the Natural Resources Defense Council, which did great work in the early 70s, mid 70s, and in the 80s, that they've got to catch up with the grassroots mobilization and become much more demanding and not accept Barack Obama and George W. Bush's all the above energy policies. Well, we'll just have some coal, some oil, gas, uh, nuclear, solar, conservation, maybe a little bit of geothermal. All of the above means that we're not going to replace fossils and nuclear, which we must do, with renewables, with solar energy of various kinds, and with dramatic improvements in the efficient utilization of energy for motor vehicles, lighting, heating, air conditioning, engines, industry, and the like. So thank you very much, Walter. This is going to be a very instructive history, which we want to help spread throughout the country, to take the resistance to fracking and the focus on on solar and efficiency to new levels faster because we have no time to lose on a planetary basis. I, I couldn't agree more. The key thing is you just can't talk about solutions. You have to achieve the solutions. Groups like Natural Resources Defense Council, Environmental Defense Fund were once 
unbelievably radical. When I worked for Joe Hyland and Bob Harris at EDF, I mean, they were amazing scientists who, as you know, were really knowledgeable about how to make public policy change. And everything I've done for almost 40 years is really derivative of what Bob Harris told me the first day I met him. Getting them with their own data, that's the fun of it. I built a company that basically uses the government data to advocate for protection of the environment and public health. And these groups just have to do more. They have to become the fighters that they once were. And I think if we can push them a little bit, to reconsider what's at stake, I think that it's going to have a huge change on the effectiveness of the environmental movement. Well said. Thank you very much, Walter Hang. And we'll continue this in the coming weeks, especially as you get more feedback from around the country to your victory in New York State. Thank you, Walter. Thank you, Ralph. Always great to talk to you. Yes. We've been talking to Walter Hang from Ithaca, New York, president of Toxics Targeting, ToxicsTargeting.com, and who is telling us a very inspiring story about a victory for grassroots activism. You're listening to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. We'll be back right after this. From Pacifica, you're listening to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour www.nader.org Welcome back to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour nader.org You can subscribe to Ralph's weekly column for free by going to nader.org Ralph, you wrote a letter to President Obama talking about the importance of our civil service and how They're kind of denigrated by politicians. And we're going to end up losing, you say, 30 percent of federal employees. There's a huge retirement coming from very experienced uh, civil servants. And, you know, they're the battered core when these politicians run for election to come to Washington. I mean, it's sort of strange that they batter the bureaucrats and with just sneering words on the campaign trail. And then they expect to to have uh, really vigorous subordinates when they run these departments and agencies and go to Congress. So I wrote a letter on December 22nd to President Obama basically saying one of the things you can do is to have work days where you go and spend a day well advanced at various departments and agencies like the Department of Interior, Department of Agriculture, Food and Drug Administration, the Internal Revenue Service, the Department of Treasury, Department of Defense. And this is almost never done. Managers are often not associated with presidents. And yet when a president goes to an agency, as President Obama did about a month ago on the Ebola issue, when he went over into neighboring Maryland to the National Institutes of Health, it had an electric impact on the people there. So there is a lot of room for motivating good civil servants, rewarding them, recognizing them, and detecting the whistleblowers among them so that when the president goes for a full day, roll up the sleeves here, not symbolic stuff, to an agency or to a department, it is very well advanced. So, for example, if he goes to the Department of Agriculture, all the problems of uh, low-level, inadequate meat and poultry inspection, the kind of concessionary attitude toward Monsanto on genetically engineered foods, the kind of waste in terms of the big agribusiness getting so many of the subsidies, all of this will be on his desk before he goes so that he can have a very deep imprint, starting with his cabinet secretary, all the way down the line. And then his staff can follow up in the succeeding weeks. So I wrote this letter making the argument that there has to be some hands-on presidential-level management reviews and probes that shake these federal agencies out of bad routines and bad practices that prevent improvement of such institutions. And let's face it, policy is important, good policy from Congress. Budgets are important, adequate law enforcement budgets against corporate crime, waste, fraud, abuse, all that. But if you don't have competent civil servants, if you don't have 
people who are rewarded for doing good work. And my father once said, how does a government employee lose his job? And I said, how, Dad? He said, by doing his job. By doing his job. The people who do their job are often on the defensive in these politicized corporate lobbied government agencies and departments. Think Department of Defense, for example. Think of Wall Street and the Department of Treasury or the Federal Reserve. So it's very important. And the last point I want to make in this letter is that when you go to colleges, when you're talking to thousands of students, almost none of them want to work in the federal government. Even though it's exciting work, it's important work, they become responsible people at a very early age. And it's not just first responders and, you know, dealing with disasters. It's dealing with all kinds of science, technology, geological surveys, for example, water preservation, reclamation projects, not to mention the more mundane issues that do the work for the country, like adequately collecting taxes from the $300 billion a year in taxes that are not paid, that are owed by a beleaguered IRS whose budget is being systematically cut to the bone by the Republicans. There's a lot of important work here, and not to mention foreign and military policy abroad. There are auditors in the Pentagon that have their eye on Lockheed Martin waste and unnecessary weapon systems. But if the president goes over there, these people get bigger visibility and a kind of support that builds inside the bureaucracy. So, not surprisingly, the letter didn't get any press because it dealt with a very important subject. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's we, your problem, Ralph. You have to stop dealing with the very important subjects. Yeah, that's right. this by now in 50 years? <laughs> uh, there were other things in the letter, too, that I urge him to read the NATO and WTO trade agreements so he doesn't just send this trans-Pacific trade agreement with all these countries to the Congress without him knowing what's in it, subordinating our health safety standards, labor, environmental, consumer standards to the imperatives of global corporate commercial trade. And I just think that there needs to be more attention by the public in writing letters to their president, regardless of whether they get a response or not. They can put it up on the web. They can send it around to the local media. And sooner or later, this will be a major form of communication from the people to the president of the United States. Uh, to drive that point home, I'm publishing my letters to George W. Bush and Barack Obama in a book that's coming out in April, published by Seven Stories Press. Because I think people have got to feel that they are not shut out by the White House, that they've got entry. After all, it was called in our history the People's House, and that's what we have to restore it to that status. And I'm sure you're entitling this Love Letters. These are love letters <laughs> of some sort. The title is even more realistic. It's called Return to Sender. Return to Sender. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Speaking of reading, my co-host David Feldman has pointed out that we are in the holiday season when hopefully a lot of people get a chance to catch up on their reading. What have you been reading lately, Ralph? Steve, a couple of books quickly. I just got a, a book a while back called Tao Te Ching. That's the philosophy of Lao Tzu, the ancient Chinese philosopher who I'm sure helped inspire Buddhist philosophy. It's very nicely done. It's illustrated. It's basically the poems, the wise poems of the master in terms of the Tao or the proper way of behaving in life. And it, it makes people reflect. It gets them a little bit off the Internet and the frenzy of Facebook or Twitter and makes them reflect. The other one I'm reading relates to some graduate students in anthropology in Berkeley, and they put their reports together in a book called Up, Down, and Sideways, Anthropologists Trace the Pathways of Power. It's edited by Rachel Stryker and Roberto Gonzalez. And it's a new wave of anthropologists that basically study up. They don't just study local situations and workers. They study corporate executives. They study Wall Street. They study trade agreements and their impact on workers in uh, Indonesia and, and Vietnam uh, and uh, Korea. They study uh, the manipulation of bankruptcy practices that affect poor workers and how bankruptcy is becoming 
a asset for big corporations. Donald Trump said the other day at the Economic Club in Washington D.C. when he was asked about you know his casinos and some of the other things going bankrupt, just brushed it off. He said, "I I use bankruptcy as an asset," which shows you how they've twisted the original concept of bankruptcy. These big corporations. And so these are whole studies study environment and subsistence, wealth and power studying bureaucracies. It's an extremely important new dimension in anthropological research. Anthropologists have always had their feet on the ground to such a degree that they haven't studied power at the top. And my sister, Laura Nader, who just taught anthropology at Berkeley for many years, did this groundbreaking essay titled Studying Up for anthropologists. And that's, I think we're going to get a lot of benefit of that in our country and around the world when anthropologists start studying power structures top down. And David, what have you been reading these days? Oh, my God. Uh, I just finished a book <laughs> on, on judicial temperament by a guy named Rosen. I was surprised to discover that Scalia is a brilliant mind and a great writer but doesn't accomplish much. It, have you met Scalia? And is he, how would you fare if you had to debate him? Well, he is a very bright man, but he does have a temper. And increasingly, he's becoming more of a curmudgeon on the court, which I think given his reactionary policies is a good thing. He's losing influence. And he does make a lot of speeches around the country, more than Supreme Court justices have ever dared make. And sometimes he, he gets himself in a little hot water with the comments he makes. I think he's been a, a force for corporatism uh, on the court and a, quite an influential one. But I think he's getting tired of the court. I think he, he likes to go hunting with Elena Kagan. Can you imagine the, the more liberal member of the Supreme wow. Court, former dean of the Harvard Law School? He's sort of fidgety. He's getting, I think I can discern a little bored with all the years he's been on the court. But going back to his confirmation, how about this one? For all of these people who lecture the Green Party on not disturbing the Democrats in presidential campaigns because of, look at the Supreme Court nominations, or, all right, he was nominated by a Republican president, and he was confirmed 98 to nothing in the Senate, including all but two Democrats who were absent. And I would go up and try to say to the progressive Democrats, senators, you got to vote against them. I mean, what is this acclamation? Was that because Rehnquist was being considered to be the chief of the Supreme Court and they weren't paying attention to Scalia? Yeah, you know, they were paying attention to him, but he was bright. He didn't hide his ideology. It's a nomination hearings. He didn't show wishy-washy. And if he said, look, the president nominated him, you know, let's respect the president's authority here under the Constitution. But you see, prior Democratic senators, they defeated Nixon's nomination of Judge Carswell. He then nominated Judge Hainsworth. He was a right-wing corporatist. They defeated him, too. But in recent decades, the Democrats in the Senate roll over. Abe Fortas, I know we're out of time, but I was, I'm also reading John Dean's book about the Rehnquist pick. Do you believe that Nixon actually conspired to get Abe Fortas to quit the, the Supreme Court? I don't know enough about that because you have to describe the little scandal he was in with that rich guy in Florida. So let's put it this way, justices of the Supreme Court are more prone to resign with scandals than members of Congress. But that was a very portentous resignation. He would have been Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Right. He was going to replace Earl Warren, and I guess he was a good man, Abe Ford. By right? comparison with who took his place, yes, of course. Right. Apparently, Warren Berger was an idiot. That's the other thing I learned. Well, he wasn't an idiot. I mean, he, Warren Berger was a plotting jurist who knew what he wanted to get. And one of the things he wanted to get was a widespread impression that there's too much litigation in America and we need to have arbitration, compulsory arbitration in its stead. And let me tell you, that one bad impact of Warren Berger's reign on the Supreme Court still plagues us today. 
as the courtroom doors continue to close, continue to be too expensive, and the courts continue to be grossly underfunded. Well, I think we have come to the end of our hour here. It's been a fascinating hour with Walter Hang talking about Ralph's letter to Obama and uh, what we've all been reading, or at least what uh, David and Ralph have been reading. I actually can't read. I, I, <laughs> I think I should admit that right now. I can only talk. But Why don't you tell the book you're reading? I, well, I'm just I'm reading a, a book. Uh, I just started. It's called Putin's Kleptocracy. And it's basically about Vladimir Putin is essentially a mafia don running a country. He's worth uh, 40 billion dollars. Yeah. Did you know but, that, Ralph? Well, we don't really know that. We don't know where it is. It could be, you know, a few gold mines uh, in Siberia, for all we know. But it's not likely that he's putting it in Swiss banks, let's put it that way, the way other authoritarian leaders do. Maybe he's right. just a good stock picker, like Warren <laughs> Buffett. Listen, gentlemen, we need to end this show. <laughs> okay. The affiliates are, are, are screaming at us right now. <laughs> well, we've come to the end of another Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Want to wish everybody a happy new year out there. On behalf of David and Ralph, join us again next week. Thank you, David and Steve, and thank you, listeners. Happy New Year. Stand up, stand up. You've been sitting way too long. Steve's in the temple. Money changing hands It's really very simple Just make a list of demands We demand freedom We demand equality We demand justice It ain't gonna happen Until folks like you and me Just stand up well, you've been sitting way too long Oh, step up You know what's right and you know what's wrong Rise up Don't let the system hold you down Stand up, oh, stand up oh. You've been sitting way too long Wow, wow Say you're tired of trying You say we have no choice Say you're just one person And who will hear your voice Don't let them fool you You have the power in your hand I'm only trying to school you Listen to me people Do you understand we gotta Stand up Oh, you've been sitting way too long Oh, step up What's right and you know what's wrong Rise up, don't let the system hold you down Stand up.
Stand up. You've been sitting way too long. Stand up. Oh, step up. Rise up. Stand up. Stand up. You've been sitting way too long. Stand up. Oh, step up. Step up. It's in your hand, key. Rise up. And you rise up. Stand up, stand up. You've been sitting way too long. Stand up. Oh, step up.